Welcome everyone to Ambition and Grit, the podcast where we explore the journeys of individuals who have conquered challenges, embraced ambition, and epitomized grit to achieve their dreams. I'm your host, Dave Leniger, and today I'm thrilled to have a true luminary in the digital marketing space. Joining us today is Amy Porterfield. Amy is a powerhouse entrepreneur, a renowned online marketing expert, and the host of the top-rated Online Marketing Made Easy podcast. Throughout her career, Amy has empowered hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs to build and scale their online businesses with her actionable strategies and courses. Today, she's here to share her wisdom, insights, and the secrets behind her remarkable success. So without further ado, let's dive into this conversation with Amy Porterfield. Uh, Amy, can you share a bit about your journey and how your determination played a role in your success? Yes. So a little bit about my journey. I always say I'm an ex-corporate girl turned accidental entrepreneur. I was in the corporate world till I was about 30 years old. My last corporate job was with peak performance coach, Tony Robbins. And I got to travel the world with Tony and work on the content that he does on stage, like Unleash the Power Within and Date with Destiny. If you know Tony, you know those events. And it was an incredible time. But making a very long story short, I found myself in a meeting at the Tony Robbins office one day where a bunch of internet marketers came in and talked about their digital courses and memberships and digital offers. And they went around the table and they were talking about what they were doing in their business. And I was asked to come to the meeting to take notes, which is very humbling. So I wasn't even invited to the main table. I was sitting at a side table taking notes. And I realized as they went around the table, All of these people, they were all men at the time, were talking about freedom, freedom to make as much money as they want, freedom to create what they wanted, freedom to call the shots. And I thought, I don't know what these guys are doing, but I want a piece of that. For the first time in my life, I wanted something different than a nine to five corporate job. But it's very scary to leave a nine to five job when you get a regular paycheck and your insurance is covered and you feel really safe. But I've since learned that what's keeping you safe is often keeping you stuck. So I had to let go of that safety and go after what I wanted. So I decided about a year after that fateful meeting, I'd go out and create my own online business. It's been 15 years now, and I help people take their knowledge, know-how, and skill set and turn that into profitable digital courses. So that's my little A little tiny area on the web is what I do, but I've been doing it for 15 years now and it's been incredibly successful. I've gotten to serve over 50,000 students, help them create their online businesses. And I feel very fortunate for what I get to do. That's awesome. Um, I also saw in your biography that uh, you were with the headquarters of uh, Harley Davidson. Yes, so at one point before my Tony Robbins job, I did marketing for Harley Davidson and I did it at the dealership level. So I had a few different dealerships that I would build out their marketing plan. And I have to say, I learned a lot from Tony Robbins. What I do in my business today, so much of that is attributed to what I learned from Tony, but I learned community from Harley Davidson. People literally tattoo the logo of the company on their body. Like they know how to engage their audience, to create stories, to create emotions that lead to people wanting to use their product over and over again. So that was a really great experience as well. So I own several motorcycle dealerships. Oh, do you? Including a couple Harleys. Oh, wow. That's such a small (laughs) world. Like I've never been interviewed by someone who had that connection. Very cool. Well, the thing's interesting is uh, the communities are tribes and each friend has their own separate tribe. It is wild. Yes. So the Harley people, they're they're hell racers. (laughs) Most of them are lawyers, doctors, business people, but they want to put on this front that we're the angry tough guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, then you go to the BMW uh, bikers and Uh, They know more about our bikes than we do. They've studied the internet. They can come in and teach a course. And they're the gentlemen of the business, I guess. Oh, that's great. It's funny to see the different tribes. Very much so. I love hearing that. Yeah. Everyone has their own little personality in there. So how do you personally define ambition and grit? And why do you think these qualities are crucial to achieving success? 
You know, I love those two words, ambition and grit. Actually, we have uh, company values and one of our company values is ambition. And so I, I subscribe to it wholeheartedly and grit is just kind of in my DNA. So I love this question. So I would look at ambition as willing to love what it takes to get what you want. And that's, that's a lot to, if you really think about it, learning to love what it takes to get what you want. Because I knew when I left my nine to five job, my very last corporate job and went into starting my own business, I knew it wasn't going to be easy. I didn't know it was going to be this hard. It's the most difficult thing I've ever done is to start my own business and build my own business. And I don't love everything I do every single day. In fact, years ago, Live video was my nemesis. I have always struggled with um, my weight and feeling insecure on camera. And it's been an up and down journey my whole life. So to get on camera and show my face was terrifying and I hated it, but I knew what I wanted. I wanted freedom. I wanted to do what I wanted, when I wanted, how I wanted. I wanted to be as creative as I could be on my own time and in my own way. And so learning to love what it takes live video, starting a podcast, putting myself out there, asking for favors. That just became, this is what I do because I know what I want. So with ambition, you got to know what you want and you would be, you're willing to show up for it. And grit, I love grit because a lot of the times we think there's an exact certain way we need to do something to get there. And then when we start doing it, it doesn't work out. And I think my grittiest moments is thinking, what can I do that not everyone is doing? Or what am I willing to do that might not look perfect? What am I willing to do that might not be conventional, what everyone else is doing, but I know what I want. I have a good friend right now who's in a launch and it's not going well, but she is willing to get on the phone with anybody who's willing to buy and talk to them. She's willing to get in her customer support desk and do all the questions, answer all the questions, even though she has a team, but she's willing to get in there. She's willing to get gritty in order to get what she wants. And I think it's going that extra mile or doing the things that normally you wouldn't do, but you need to do in order to make it work. Ambition can sometimes clash with the need for realistic goal setting. How do you find the balance between ambition and goals and achievable milestones? Ooh. So we are big at goal setting in my company. We set yearly goals and then from there we set quarterly goals. And I have a team that really thrives on ambitious goals. So goals that might feel a little bit out of reach. However, we're going to go for it and do what we can. And so when you when you talk about ambition sometimes clashing with goals, I think what we do is we set goals that are they might be a little bit ambitious but they are rooted in evidence. So what I mean by that is we're setting a goal based on what we did last time or something similar to what we've done in the past so that we are really crunching numbers. Like if I asked my team, how did you get to that goal? They've got a whole formula of how they got there. So we have a plan behind our goals. This is how we're going to get there. This is how we did it before. But that ambition usually comes in when we have to push a little bit harder when things aren't working just as we had planned. I recently did a launch and we were about 10% below where we should have been coming into the finish line. And that's where that grittiness you mentioned, that ambition has to come in, where what are we willing to do to push it a little harder or do something a little different to get to that goal? But all of our goals are definitely rooted in um, proven strategies and numbers that we've seen before. And I think to me, that's really important. I think that makes sense. So Amy, grit is often seen as a trait that can be developed. How do you cultivate grit in your own life? And what advice do you have for others looking to build this quality? You know, I, I love that you said that this is something that you can, a muscle essentially that you can build. And I do believe that. So when I think about, you know, incorporating more grit or building more grit into what you're doing, I think it comes down to taking away what you're supposed to do. You know, in the corporate world, it was if anyone ever said to me, well, that's not in my job description. I, I can't even imagine living a life that way. But a lot of people think that way. That's not in my job description. I don't do that for when you're your own boss or you're working in an online business. 
I think you've got to put down what's expected or what you think it should be. And you do, again, whatever it takes to get to the goal that you have. And so it there's not a lot of, I do this and I don't do that. I do anything it takes. And I think that's why I am a successful business owner. I've had my hands in everything. Now, as I've grown as a business owner, I know that's not sustainable or scalable, but at one point, let's say eight, nine, 10 years ago, I was wearing all the hats. And I think that created that grittiness in me. I'm willing to do whatever it takes. And then I had to grow and mature as a leader and say, okay, but I'm also going to never scale this business if I'm doing all the things. But I think it's that willingness to get in there and get your hands dirty. I'll agree with that. Um, failure is an inevitable part of the journey. Can you share a significant failure that taught you valuable lessons and how did you bounce back from it? Mm. I have a really big, what could be considered a failure. I talk about in, in my book, Two Weeks Notice, where I was a couple of years into my business and I had just hit that million dollar mark. So in that one year, 2013, we had hit $950,000. And for an online entrepreneur, that million dollar mark is a really big deal. So I had just almost hit it. It was just me and the business. And for some reason, I felt like I couldn't do it alone. And somebody came into my life and saw value in me and basically suggested, why don't we be partners in your business? And it was, it was a man and he was incredibly strategic and savvy. And I'd like to tell you that I consulted lawyers. I, I took my time to make the decision. I really dug in to fit, weigh the pros and the cons. One sleep, one sleep. And I said, yes, you can be 50, 50 partner in my business. And then it was, and I think it came from a really big insecurity. Like, what if this doesn't work out? I can't do this alone. I don't even know what I'm doing hardly, even though I had almost hit the million dollar mark that year. And so I brought in this man to be a silent partner in my company. And for a few years, we did incredibly well. We went to multi-million dollars, served so many people in terms of how to grow their businesses and create courses. And the business really went to another level until one day I looked in the mirror and thought, I don't even know who I am anymore. I allowed this man, it was all my fault. I allowed this man to become my boss. We'd get on a phone call and talk about the business. We'd hang up. I'd have 20 action items to his one. When things didn't work out, I would call him. Are we going to be okay? Is this all right? I, I couldn't even make decisions on my own anymore. And I fell right back into having a boss because I'm really good at having a boss. I had a boss till I was 30 years old. And so I realized this is, this is a bad situation. I've lost myself. I'm not loving my company anymore. I'm no longer creative. So I decided that I was going to get out of this partnership. But what happened was we couldn't come to an agreement. And even though I had created the business, it looked like we'd have to dissolve the entire business because he wasn't going to let me have it. And I wasn't going to let him have it. And we couldn't agree on a buyout number. And so this went on for a year. I think I cried every day for a year because this was my baby. I'd created this business from nothing and I was going to lose it because I made a bad decision out of fear and out of uh, lack of confidence, quite honestly. And I just did not believe in myself. This is many, many, many years ago. And so long story short, this went on for a whole year. We couldn't talk to each other. It was really, really upsetting. We talked through our lawyers. And finally, one morning I woke up and I thought, I will burn this down and build it back better. If that's what it's going to take, enough is enough. I will burn this down and build it back better. And as soon as I like, I always call it my inner Beyonce. Once that came to me, I thought game on. I can't lose at this point. And then the very next day, our lawyer suggested mediation. So we went into mediation and we were able to work it out and I was able to buy him out. But I don't think I would have ever agreed to do that if I didn't believe I could start over. So what I teach my students many times is, are you willing to start from scratch? Are you willing to leave that nine to five job and start with zero money in the bank or zero Instagram followers or zero people on your email list so that you could build something incredible? And I think a lot of times it takes letting down our egos, getting clear on what we want and reaching for courage, not confidence. Confidence is when you have a proven track record. Courage is I'm going to take this leap of faith because I want this bad and I'm going to do whatever it takes to get there. So my biggest mistake was saying yes to somebody where I didn't vet it and it was out of fear. Protect me, take care of me, rescue me. 
Now I've learned that I could do this on my own, but it took a very long road and I almost lost my company because of it. That's interesting. How do you approach goal setting and what strategies do you employ to stay focused and motivated throughout the journey? I approach goal setting essentially what I had said earlier, based on any old data or past data, and then also really looking at where I want to take the business. I never set goals before I have a vision. So something in our business that is really important is a five-year vision for the company. And because I'm the owner, I will write that vision and I will work on it and work on it. It takes me a while. I recently redid our vision and then I'll roll it out to the entire team and get everybody's buy-in. Once we're clear about where we're going, what our vision is, and also what our values are, what do we value the most? I mentioned ambition is one of our goals, our values, but we have many of them. But once we're clear on our vision and our values, then it's time to set goals. So those are two things that I always do and remind myself of before I do that. But once we start setting goals, like I mentioned, what we do is we set our yearly goals. We do this in October of the coming year and we set our yearly goals. Again, we get a whole buy-in of the team members that need to buy in. And then um, about three weeks before the new quarter, we set quarterly goals based on the yearly goals. And we use EOS, uh, Entrepreneurial Operating System. It, it was a system I learned in the book, Rocket Fuel. And so we use this EOS system of how we set goals. But one of the things I learned in this EOS method is that you have to keep coming back to them again and again. And I didn't used to do this in the past, but now every single month we're looking at our goals and reminding ourselves. Every quarter we're reminding ourselves of our yearly goals. I think goals are useless unless they're right in front of your face and you see them and you remember them on a regular basis. Ambitious goals, they often come with uncertainty. How do you deal with uncertainty and keep moving forward when the path is difficult? You know, like I had mentioned, I recently did a launch where we were about 10% uh, off of our goal. And I have a CEO and she reminded me, she said, look, we need to set ambitious goals. And because we're always thriving to do better, we always want to up level in the business, but we're not always going to hit them. And we didn't hit this goal. Again, we were 10% off. And so she said, the most important thing is how we now show up for ourselves and for our team that we didn't hit a goal. What do, what do we do? What does this mean? And how do we keep our um, morale up? Because my team is bonused on hitting revenue goals and profit goals. And so they know what our revenue goal is and they know they will make a certain amount of money over their salary if we can hit these goals. And so when we don't, they feel really, really frustrated. So one of the things that we do is we do a debrief after every launch, whether it was good, bad, or ugly, we do a debrief where we come together as a team and we dissect what worked and what didn't work and we document it. And we document decisions that we're going to do for the next launch. I learned this in my Tony Robbins days. Every time that man gets off stage, he does a debrief with someone in the creative department, which happened to be me at the time. So he's like, all right, let's debrief. And the minute he gets off stage, and so we do this really quickly after a launch so we don't forget all the good ideas that we had or the pain that we had while we were going through it. So that's one thing is getting making our goals ambitious so we're always striving to do better, but knowing we will not always hit them debriefing what went right, what went well. And then from there, the next time we go out, we're not going to take those goals down. We're going to try some new things to get there. But it's okay that we don't hit goals in our business. And as a leader, I have to make sure my team knows that so that it's not like, oh my gosh, everything's doom and gloom. We're good. We set big goals and we're not always going to hit them. Success doesn't have to be a solo endeavor. How important is collaboration and having a support system, uh, your team, to achieving your goals. Entrepreneurship can be so lonely. Building a business can be so lonely. And a lot of times, your friends and family do not get it. If you asked my mom what I do, and I've been doing this for 15 <clears throat> years, she could never say what I do. She's very, very confused. It's just, it, when people aren't in it, they don't get it. So you, it is very important to rely on your support system and as well as your team. 
And you know, I didn't do this well in the beginning. In the beginning, I didn't share revenue goals with my team. In the beginning, I, I kept them out of the loop of a lot of things thinking I was protecting them or I wanted to be private because it's a privately held business. Now I realize that served me it did not serve me at all. And so when we're going into any promo, everyone knows the revenue goals, they know exactly how we're gonna get there, and they know every step of the way where we are. And I do believe that gives me a lot of support because I'm not in it alone, and it gets them really excited to uh, get in the action of it. So I could never do this without the support of my team. For uh, someone listening who may be facing challenges, uh, or feeling uh, discouraged, what advice would you give them? First, let yourself feel those feelings. I, I have a coach that says your feelings won't kill you as long as you don't believe everything you think from those feelings. So I, I have a lot of support. I have a life coach and I have a business coach and I have a fitness coach. So like I'm all about the coaching because I know that I can't do this alone. And I have a business coach that tells me all the time, you cannot believe everything you think. And thoughts create those emotions. So as long as you have a thought, it's okay. It's not your fault. There's all the thoughts come into our head and a lot of them are negative. But you have to be so careful about believing that thought and letting it turn into an emotion such as, I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. This is never going to work. Who am I to be doing this? Imposter syndrome. All of that is so normal, but you have to manage your mindset. When I worked for Tony Robbins, he used to say that 80% of success as an entrepreneur is your mindset. 20% is the mechanics, the strategies. I firmly believe that. So every single day, I am listening to a podcast that's going to inspire me or encourage me to keep moving forward. I read business books and self-help books to fuel my brain. I'm really careful what I allow inside my mind because it could be a very dark place. But when you're going through a challenge, when you feel as though everything is not working out, just remember that that is absolutely part of the journey of entrepreneurship. My first two years were so hard. I thought every single day this is not going to work, but I remembered what I wanted. I wanted freedom more than I wanted safety. So you got to get clear on what you want. And when it's hard, keep coming back to, but what do I ultimately want? And it will help you stay in the game. Amy, have you uh, experienced any significant mind shifts in your journey that contributed to your ambition and grit? And how can others adopt these shifts in their own lives? Yes, I love this. Any mind shifts? You know, I, I had, I've actually had a big one. So I am a very sensitive person. I feel everything and I get my feelings hurt very easily. I hate to say that as a 40 year old woman, that 40 something year old woman that I get my feelings hurt and I love deeply. I care deeply and I treat my business like I, I treat my family. And sometimes that doesn't serve me well. I'm very sensitive and I feel a lot of emotions. So one day I went to my business coach, Michael, and I said, help me have more um, strength in my emotions. I need to have, uh, I need to be grittier. I need to be stronger. I don't want things to bother me so much or hurt me when things don't work out. And he said, Amy, I think part of your superpower is your sensitivity. I'm like, no, 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 it's not. He said, if you would use it as is, as that, it could be. So what he explained to me is you're sensitive and you're strategic. You're sensitive and you're a go-getter. You're sensitive, but you're a planner. And so having that sensitivity, compassion, empathy, really serves you well when you're strategic in your business. It allows your students to feel connected and feel seen. It allows your team to feel taken care of, all of that. So my big mindset shift was I took something that I thought was my biggest weakness and I started looking at it as it was my superpower. And anybody can do this because we are who we are. This is how we were made. I was made a sensitive person since I was very, very young. And so I started to look at it as my superpower and I started to find proof in that. So it's a mindset shift that has served me well. That's awesome. Last question. As someone who's achieved substantial success, how do you see ambition and grit contributing to your long-term legacy and your impact on others? You know, I've been doing this for a long time. And sometimes I think, 
Well, what else is there? You know, I, I've been doing this for a long time. I've had great success. And I think my ambition and my grit, especially lately, as now I've gotten into my 40s, I've started to think, but what if there's a whole other chapter for me? And I start to look for proof of that. So as a female entrepreneur, I've started to study women who hadn't made it until they were in their 50s or 60s or what Martha Stewart has done or women that are crushing it that are older than me and looking for proof that there might be a whole other chapter for me. And I think without ambition and without grit, I could just say, look, this worked out well. My time here was spent well. I did well and I'm good. But I don't think I ever want to give up. So I'm looking forward to my next chapter. I don't know what that'll be. But I don't sure, either. We'll see. I'm sure it'll be a success. Thank you, my friend. Amy, thanks for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Okay. We'll see you again. Bye for now. Bye-bye.